Thank you. And uh, if anybody would like to volunteer a better pointer than this, I'm uh, happy to use it. Uh, but uh, bear with me. Uh, my uh, title here is uh, rather broad. And oh, I first want to acknowledge uh, many collaborators uh, that I have on the, the work I'm going to present to you today. And uh, to try to narrow things a bit from, from, from my title, I, I want to start with a slide of just sort of what we are and what we aren't doing. Uh, so what, uh, what we started doing in this project is, I don't know if this is going to work at all. Uh, anyway, a, a, a purely data-driven uh, approach to forecasting. And um, most of the results I show you today are going to be of that type. But what we really have in mind when it comes to, uh, say, atmospheric weather and climate is not, a, not to throw the model away, but to use machine learning in hybrid with existing physics-based models. And you can think of what we're doing in the, uh, you know, the second bullet here is, is we're doing uh, we're trying to use machine learning to correct the systematic errors in the model tendencies. And uh, so I'm going to show you uh, some of that, but that, that work is ongoing. Uh, these, these bottom bullets here are based on conversations with several of you the last couple of days, uh, things that we might be doing but are, 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 are not at this point. And so that includes uh, uh, sort of post-processing correction. That is, if you're interested in the 48-hour forecast, Rather than try to correct, correct the model tendency, the very short-term forecast, it may be better uh, to do some sort of post-processing correction to the 48-hour model forecast. Probably it's best to do both, both correct the tendencies and the post-process. Um, we could be doing bias correction for observation operator. And uh, this last bullet, I mean, a couple of you mentioned this motivation, which, which, which I like and which is close to what we're doing already, but, but rather than trying to, to, to eliminate model errors per se, just to try to speed up the computation of the uh, uh, either forecast model or observation operator. For example, to be able to uh, do some super high resolution model runs offline and then uh, sort of teach a machine learning system to emulate, you know, emulate, at least partially emulate that computation to be able to uh, sort of forecasted high resolution within uh, higher resolution within operational constraints. So um, as I said, what, what I'm going to show you today is, is, is sort of based on these first two bullets. And uh, well, next, just, just, just sort of run through a little bit uh, introduction to machine learning or machine learning jargon, at least. And so I think of machine learning algorithms as, as, as being trained on a uh, particular data set to perform a, a rather specific task. What I'm going to talk about uh, here is, is, is uh, you know, what's called supervised learning. Uh, so that is, uh, we start with some sort of generic input-output equations. For example, in Mark's talk this morning, these were ODEs with a sort of quadratic or bilinear um, right-hand side. And these, these input-output equations have lots of parameters. And then in training, we try to find the parameter values that in some sense minifies the discrepancy between the actual outputs of the equations and the desired outputs of the equations. And so, you know, that, that discrepancy is expressed in some sort of cost function that we try to uh, minimize, and that's the, uh, that's the training. In the most applications of machine learning, I'm talking about Google and so forth, most applications are what I call static sort of tasks. You're trying to map inputs to outputs, and the order in which they come is arbitrary. You don't want, if you're doing face recognition or something like that, you don't want the outputs to depend on the order in which you've received uh, the inputs. But the, the type of thing I'm interested in is what I call a dynamic task in mapping an input time series to an output time series. And the results I'm going to show you today, though a lot of what I say applies to other machine learning methods, what I'm going to show you today is, is results with a particular machine learning method called uh, reservoir computing that I think is particularly well suited to these dynamic tasks. And so let me then, uh, a slide about reservoir computing and its history. Uh, 
the reservoir in this picture is a, 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 is a driven dynamical system, driven by an input time series, and it responds to that time series in some nonlinear way. And, but the central thing that separates reservoir computing from other machine learning methods is that we don't try to optimize all the parameters. That, that the, we do nonlinear processing, and then we have some linear map from the reservoir state space to the state space of the signal we're trying to uh, output. And it's only the parameters of that linear map, that linear post-processing map, that we try to train to particular uh, uh, training data. And so one advantage of this approach is that it makes this, the training a lot simpler. We're just doing linear regression in a rather high dimensional space. Uh, but another advantage is that we don't have to have control over the internal parameters of the reservoir. And so the reservoir could be a hardware device, an optical device, an FPGA, uh, various sorts of things that, that it could run a lot faster than a uh, uh, software reservoir, although all the results I show you will be from, from software. Um, and then, so the training protocol is just, we have a training data set that consists of an input time series U of t, a desired output V of t. We feed the input time series to the reservoir and it responds with a trajectory R of t in its state, state space. And then we linearly regress that R of t to the desired V of t. That's our training. We could do something a little more complicated, you know, sophisticated in linear regression, but that's, that's generally what we do. The last bullet here is just, uh, there's a Scholarpedia page that uh, goes into a little bit more about the methodology and its history. Um, here's a cartoon of uh, what's going on uh, during the training. Uh, so there's, the input is coming in from the left. Uh, there are some parameters here, W in, that map, er, have to do with mapping the input space to the reservoir state space. M represents internal parameters of the reservoir dynamics. W out represents this, 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 this linear output layer I was talking about. And again, it's only the, the, the parameters containing this matrix W out that we fit to the training data. The other parameters are sort of chosen in, in advance before we see the training data. Um, Here's an equation. This is, this is not what the reservoir dynamics have to be, but uh, a, a particular example of what the reservoir dynamics could be, and more or less what we're, we're, what we're doing in, in software for the results I'm going to show you. I'm showing you the equation in continuous time, just because I think it's a little bit easier to parse what's, what, what, what's going on in that case. But in software, we're doing you know, some, some discrete time approximation to this. And, uh, Second bullet is just a little bit about how we choose those internal parameters advanced. They're, they're, you know, they're, they're chosen at random according to some distribution. And getting these things to be the right scale is important in getting this, this methodology to be work. Getting a time scale right is important too, as getting the time scale of the reservoir to be commensurate with the time scale of the, um, if, if we're trying to process dynamics, Getting, getting it commensurate with time scale dynamics. And when we get to dynamics that has multiple time scales, we're going to have to do, you know, also have maybe multiple reservoirs that respond at different time scales. Um, but have, having chose all, uh, chose all these things, so there, there's an art to making these uh, choices. And then, but then the training or the fitting is just to find this output weight matrix W out so that the uh, the output v hat, both here and in the previous slide, I say v hat to say that the output is some estimate of uh, uh, some signal v of t. And in the training, we know what that desired signal is. And so we want to minimize the difference between the estimated v of t and the actual v of t in the least square sense with some regularization in practice. I didn't write that down here. Um, so as a first example of using this methodology um, is what, you know, what, what we call in, in our paper inference, but in, in some sense you can think of it as data simulation without a model. Um, in the, uh, as, as I pose things here, uh, just, just, just for simplicity, I'm assuming a partially observed states, I'm assuming we directly measure some state variables. We want to infer 
the other state variables. So u of t, we want to infer v of t from u of t. But you could also think of u of t as observations and v of t as the model state we want to infer. Uh, regardless, uh, in this purely data-driven approach, we can't do anything unless we have some training data for v of t. So in, in the latter case, if u is observations, v is a model state, v of t could be a reanalysis perhaps. In the scenario I posed here, I, I want to assume that we can measure the complete state at some great expense for some limited period of time and then try to infer the expensive to measure to variables uh, in terms of cheaper to measure variables on an ongoing basis. And so the, the, you know, the U of T and the V of T in the training, again, are, 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 are you know, sort of parts of the, uh, uh, the model state. And then after the training, we continue to involve that, that, that same equation, that same reservoir dynamics, listening to the input U of T and estimating uh, V of T. And uh, you can probably guess what my first example is going to be or what the dynamical system is going to be. Uh, Lorenz 1963. And uh, so I'll show you how this works where we're inferring Y of T and Z of T from X of T. Okay. And uh, I want to just you know, touch on here. You'll, you'll see this on my slides too here. I may, I may forget to mention it in the future. but. This gives you an idea of the dimensionality of the reservoir dynamics that we need. It's, it's about 100 times the dimensionality of the Lorenz itself. Uh, the amount of training data, 200 times steps, which, which does, shouldn't mean so much to you right now, but let me show you in, terms, in, in the picture here. This is 20 time units worth of Lorenz evolution. So what we're training on is basically 10 times as much as this, just a few hundred oscillations we're training on. What I'm showing you here is after the training is done, here is the U of T on the top panel, and in the bottom, the inferred V of T, and, or Y of T and Z of T against the real ones, and you know, they match within the resolution of the, the, the graph. It works uh, extremely well once, once we've tuned things appropriately. Um, but most of what I'm going to be talking about is, is rather than this um, so inference is, is, is forecasting, and for forecasting, there's, a, you know, there's an additional complexity to the, uh, uh, the methodology, and so let me, let me try to talk through it in words, and then, you know, I'll, I'll show you a picture and some equations and so forth. Uh, but I want to suppose we're, 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 our training data is at some uh, granularity or sample rate tau, you know, if you're thinking in terms of weather and atmospheric data, you think of tau as being on a time scale hours, but we want to forecast on the time scale of days, let's say. We, we have a, a forecast lead time that's, you know, some multiple of that uh, uh, tau. And so one option is to try to train directly n times tau units into the future, directly, you know, whatever our forecast lead time is. So given, give, given the inputs up to now, forecast 48 hours in the future. Um, and so then our, 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 in the training, our, our training data would consist just of a trajectory of u of t. The desired output would be a time shifted version of that f, and we would time shift n times tau steps in the future. And um, in our experiments with simple models at least, we found, so th this would be like the post-processing I was talking about earlier on. Uh, um, and at least with simple models, we found it more effective to try to correct the tendency of the short-term uh, forecast and then, and, and then cycle that. So the machine learning instead, we're going to train just to forecast a short-time tau into the future and then cycle that forecast. And in practice, for more complex systems, we should probably be trying to do both, as I, as I said at the beginning. But this, this is how we're going to do things for the results I'm going to, I'm going to show you here. And uh, you know, this feedback approach was, was probably, you know, or we, we, we learned it from the reservoir computing literature, but you could do this with any other machine learning system that performs this short-term forecast. So here's a picture of what's going on. Um, after the training is done, that's what that time capital T is. I suppose we want to do a forecast. We, we might want to initialize our forecast sometime t0 into the future. That's what this t0 is. So we've done our training, but we keep listening to the input signal u of t until the, until the signal stops, and we want to forecast forwards from there. So I'm, I'm assuming now we have 
u of t up to time t zero. We can use the previous equation up to that point and then when we no longer know u of t we switch, we switch on this feedback loop I've directed, depicted here. We're estimating u of t at some short lead time and then we feed back it, that in for the next step of the uh, forecast. So, in equations, again, I'm representing these in, in, in continuous time, uh, but this becomes now an autonomous system for, for R. So, we've built at this point in this artificial reservoir sp state space, we built an autonomous or an empirical model or in Mark's language, a surrogate model that emulates the dynamic, if it works at least, it emulates the dynamics that we want when we project back down to the, uh, the space that U lives in through this uh, second equation. So, let me show you how this works again for Lorentz uh, 63. So, uh, actual z of t from Lorentz uh, in blue predicted in red and they lie on top of each other for a while and of course, since it's chaotic, they don't lie on top of each other forever. Uh, and I, I, I'm, I'm not I'm not going to try to, you know, convince you this is the best possible way to do short-term forecast in this uh, situation, but uh, it works. But what was actually more interesting to me about this sort of picture was that even after the forecast goes bad in terms of the, the, the forecast error being large, the uh, empirical model continues to display Lorenz-like dynamics. This is sort of the second half of this picture. And so, I'll show you what happens if, if, if we run that model, the empirical model further. Um, so, the blue is the actual time series, uh, long-term integration of the Lorentz, you know, long-term integration forward from the training data we used. The red is after the training is over, iterating this autonomous map. It's not seeing anything about the, uh, you know, this trajectory here and it, it more or less, it's sort of learned the attractor in a sense. Um, this thing is just Poincaré map for those of you who that means something to, but given time I'm going to skip that. Um, so, I want a, a couple slides here just about what we understand from the theoretical point of view, but uh, it, it's admittedly very limited. Uh, but I think it's, still like it's, it, it's useful in terms of thinking about how these things work. So, um, you know, this, this is the setting in, in a more abstract setting here. This equation here for R of t, this g is, is you, you know, in what I showed you before that was the thing with the hyperbolic tangent and, and, and so forth. Uh, but the reservoir equations is driven by a signal u of t. The u of t in this situation, in what I showed you before, the u of t and s of t were identical in that, you know, simple example. But in general, u of t would be some measurement of the state of some uh, system s, system or uh, f that we're, that we're trying to learn in some sense. So, the g is what we, what we sort of choose for our machine learning system. The f is sort of the unknown as well as the s. Um, and, you know, given, given some assumptions, uh, if this g is uniformly contracting as a function of r, uh, then the, how we initialize the reservoir state becomes irrelevant if we have long enough training data. And, um, but we get something uh, e e even stronger than that and that's uh, what's called generalized synchronization. Um, that is, given the hypotheses on the previous slide, Asymptotically, the reservoir state is a function of the state of the uh, system that's generating the signal u of t. And uh, so, e even though we compute this reservoir state as a function not just of the current u of t, but uh, the past history of the u of t, what we're getting is actually a function of the current uh, underlying state s of t. And so, there's at least some hope that we can then recover S of t or U of t which depends on S of t, recover that from R of t. Uh, but, the, you know, the, 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 there's no way to really guarantee that this phi is uh, invertible. The situation is maybe somewhat similar to delay coordinate embedding for example, that there are some generosity results that suggest if R is high enough dimensional compared with S, then phi is likely to be one to one. But, so there's, we, you know, we wrote a paper about this and there's a lot more in the paper, but uh, it uh, gets to be much more hand waving at this point and given the time, I'm going to press back on into showing you some results and how we, 
how do we intend to scale this sort of methodology up to, you know, sort of atmospheric size problems. Um, so as an immediate, intermediate step here, I'm going to show you some results with Kuruma Sibosinski uh, uh, system here. And at, the, at this parameter value, which is the size of the system, uh, the dynamics are maybe 12 to 15 dimensional. Uh, so a little, bit, a little bit higher dimensional than Lorenz. Uh, again, you know, you know, we're, we're, the dimensionality of our reservoir is a couple orders of magnitude larger than that. Uh, the training data for what I'm about to show you is about 2,000 uh, Lyapunov times. And uh, let me go ahead to the picture here. Uh, so in the horizontal axis of these pictures is time, the vertical axis is the space variable x, the color coding is the solution u to the PDE. And the time span here is 40, and so the training data is about 50 times, is 50 times the time span I'm showing you here. So again, just to give you a picture of how much we're training on. The top here is just a run of the, the model, the kuramos sibosinski equation, discretized. Um, the middle panel here is a, a, a forecast we get from the machine learning from the reservoir. And the bottom is just the difference between the two. And so we get a forecast that's quantitatively accurate to a, a few Lyapunov times. And the reason they're showing you 40 Lyapunov times is, again, to give a sense that even after the error in the forecast becomes reasonably large, the dynamics, we seem to have learned the dynamics reasonably well, pictorially. Um, we computed Lyapunov exponents for the real model and for the machine learning model, and they line up better than we expected. Um, so let me, uh, let me then move on to uh, the hybrid approach I was talking about at the, the, the beginning. So I want to suppose that we do have a model, but that there's some model error that is, uh, you know, keeping us, whatever our goal is, keeping us from getting as good results as, as, as we would like. Um, and so we want to use this uh, machine learning approach to uh, sort of improve the model or augment the model rather than replace it. And so what we do in this approach is we, we feed the same input to the model and to the reservoir, the machine learning component, and we optimize a linear combination of the, the model output and the reservoir output. In the language of some of the talks earlier in this meeting, uh, we're, just, we're building a supermodel between the, the, the imperfect physics-based model and our machine learning model. Okay. And I'm going to show you some results, again, from, from Kuramo Sibosinski and our, 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 our sort of naive form of model error here is we've just, we, we we're sort of tweaking one of the parameter values. So we're generating our truth trajectory at a parameter value of one, epsilon is equal to zero, but then there's our imperfect model we're going to use a non-zero value of epsilon in the evolution equation. This allows us to at least sort of vary the magnitude of the model error. And uh, so I'm going to just show you a couple examples. Um, oh, there's just a picture of, of, of cartoon of what the approach is that, uh, again, we feed a U of T in the model. In, in this, I'm assuming the U of T is the entire model state here. Um, and uh, so we forecast with the model, we look at the reservoir response to U of T, we linearly combine those into a forecast. And uh, so here's a couple of results. These pictures are all like the third panel on my previous picture. They're the difference between the uh, forecast and the, the verification of the truth. Um, the top is the difference between the, the, you know, the, the imperfect model and the truth initialized from the same initial conditions. The reservoir is initialized from whatever initial conditions it sort of learns for itself by listening to the, uh, uh, the input signal for a certain period of time. And so both approaches by themselves are able to forecast out to about two Lyapunov times. In hybrid, we can forecast much further into the future. Now, the, here the model error, I should say, is just uh, a, a 0.01, so 1% error in that, uh, so it's constant in both time and space. And so this, this sort of represents a situation with small model error and relatively large computational resources in a situation where both approaches alone have sort of commensurate skill. Yep? 
What's that? Go back to the slide. Mm -hmm. That is a, a term there with the second derivative term. The the, the, yeah, the second derivative term, which is, which is um, yeah, I, I, although it's actually not dissipation because it's, it's a negative sign over here. The dissipation is actually in the, you know, the fourth order term. But yeah, we're just, I mean, we, 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 you know, we, we've done similar things with putting the error into other coefficients. But yes, I, I, the, I'm putting the error into the coefficient of that second derivative term. Um, Whoop. Here's another scenario in which uh, supposing our computational resources are more limited, only a 500 dimensional reservoir state, and our model error is larger at 10% in that coefficient. And either the imperfect model and the you know, forecast is poor, the machine learning forecast is really lousy, uh, but again, in, in, in hybrid, you're able to produce a reasonable forecast. I have no illusion that we're going to get these kind of improvements in a realistic sort of scenario, but this is just to give you a sense of what the, the potential of the hybrid approach is. Now, I want to turn to how, how we scale things up to a, uh, uh, so, you know, a weather size sort of system, and since I'm already about out of time, I'm going to skip through the details, but uh, we sort of do things in parallel with a bunch of reservoirs, each in charge of a local geographic region. And I want to show you just some preliminary results. These are just from last week. So I, I, I apologize that they're a little bit thin. Uh, but we've been trying to develop this hybrid approach using a speedy model. We don't have the hybrid working yet, coded yet. The results I'm going to show you are just for machine learning only uh, uh, forecast. And what we're trying to forecast here is era five reanalysis uh, sort of interpolated to the speeding model grid. And that's going to be both our training and our verification data. And the training data requirements for what I'm going to show you, uh, it's nine years of hourly data from that reanalysis. Uh, we're using around 1,000 reservoirs in parallel, each of which is similar size to what we were using for Kermo Sivicinski, but there are thousands of them. And uh, Here's just a, a comparison with persistence. So the persistence forecast is red, is just a forecast that the atmospheric state is constant in time. And so, I mean, we're, we're happy just to beat persistence with a, with, with a purely data-driven approach. That, that, that's the blue line here. We beat it for a while, and then things go a little bit haywire. Uh, the, the, the green is the speedy model, which, which you know, ha, has a similar skill over this 24 to 48 hour uh, time series. I mean, of course, we're using speedy model for something it wasn't you know, intended to. Uh, so, so we hope in the hybrid to see some significant improvement in this case as well. This is just what a 48-hour forecast from the machine learning only looks like. I'm just showing you a picture uh, to try to convince you that th at least there's no obvious artifacts of this parallel approach, chopping things up into uh, small regions to, to, to forecast. And uh, two more slides. Uh, you know, I don't have much more to say or results to show you in terms of incorporating this approach with uh, data simulation, but that's sort of what we're working on right now. In the interest of time, I'm not going to go through all these, uh, uh, all these points here, and, uh, but I'd be happy to talk about later. But th th there are a variety of ways to, to, to integrate the machine learning, the model, and the data simulation uh, component, and I don't think we've found the, maybe the best way yet. Uh, but uh, here's a summary of what I've tried to convince you of. And again, I'll let you read these, and uh, let's stop now to see. We have a little time for questions. Thank you very much. Questions or comments? Yeah. Thank you very much for this interesting talk. Uh, so what is the impact of the observational error in your training uh, phase? So the... the uh, you know, I mean, the results I show you are, are robust to, 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 to noise in the, in, in the training data, so we, 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 we've done that. Training act, noise actually improves things in some cases. It's a little bit subtle, but in, like in the, in the results I just showed you, in, in, in terms of the last results I showed you, uh, the, the adding noise in the training actually helped quite a lot. I think the reason is we want the machine learning to learn to respond to things in the neighborhood of the attractor rather than the attractor itself. If it, only, if it only learns on stuff that's exactly on the tractor, it can't learn the stability or can't learn the dynamics off the tractor. So at least to a certain level, noise, noise can actually help.
So the the uh, control theory people, they probably say, oh, what you're trying to do is just p um, design an observer for your system, although the catch is obviously that you don't know your underlying system very well and you do not have complete design freedom on your observer. Mm -hmm. right? Is this, it, I mean, it, would you say this is a useful uh, or viewpoint on what you're trying to do nonetheless? Or? So you're, you're thinking the reservoir state as the observer? In a way, yes. It, yeah. I, I, I know it's not a well-posed question what I'm asking, but... <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I mean it, yes, it sounds like a reasonable way to interpret, but I, I, I myself don't know the control theory sort of well enough to maybe give a more intelligent answer than that. Uh, this was very interesting. I mean, um, as I said in the opening talk, I don't think we should allow ourselves to be chased from the paradise of using dynamics, you know, human inferred dynamics, mm -hmm. but the hybrid method and the skew product point of view and the idea of using the hardware of a reservoir, I think, are all very nice, and I like your realistic assessment of some of this Thank not you. being directly translatable to the big machines, but still quite interesting. Mm -hmm. So, more power to you. Thank you very much.